The 16th of June 1976 will forever be etched in our collective psyche. The Soweto student uprising turned into a bloodbath when innocent lives were ambushed for their defiance against Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. The apartheid government had a policy of conscription, making it compulsory for eligible white males to join the army. And these armed forces would in turn become the executors of thousands of young black lives. What the truth and reconciliation process attempted to do fell short. It is incumbent on all of us to find common ground to forgive and restore our society. And as we commemorate 40 years since the brutal killings of June 16, 1976, we joined by a survivor of June 16 massacre, and that is Mempolina Mohale Buyeye. She's also part of the June 16 Foundation. And uh, we have uh, a former uh, uh, South African Defense Force conscript, and that is Dr. Uh, Kubis. Harbor and in studio as well we joined by Bishop Malu Simpumloana from uh, the SACC that's the South African Council of Churches to all I guess thanks indeed for your time and welcome but, uh, Bishop Mpumloana let's just start with you in terms of uh, putting together the uh, 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 former conscripts and the survivors of June 16 in this program of reconciliation what, what has the steps been how have you come up, uh, up to this point it mainly was the initiative of the conscripts generation themselves uh, which coincided with the commitment of the churches to establish a, a campaign for the South Africa will pray for which is based on a platform of healing and reconciliation then of course dealing also with issues of poverty and unemployment economic transformation and anchoring democracy now those issues are all on this platform of healing and reconciliation so when the initiative came from the conscript generation to say <clears throat> we were involved because the army was it was it was the law to do this and we would like <clears throat> to have a ministry to ourselves that enables us to fully reconcile and be part of a futuristic development of south africa and of course i should add in that i always had the perception that the conscripts were actually the shooters no actually it is not the case it was the police that were shooting at, in 1976, it was not the soldiers. Uh, but the soldiers did get brought in later as a backup to the police. And they, I remember that they used to man the roadblocks uh, outside the townships. But most of the work was actually being done by the police. And so even though uh, they did not do the shooting at the time, they would like to use this moment to acknowledge that they were part of a system that occasioned 1976 and would also like to say that this because this is the rapture of South Africa which in my view led to eventually having 1994 it makes sense that they should choose that moment to say let's use this for our own peacemaking in society. Yeah, Dr. Herber, as a former conscript, and I mean, these are things that many of us will only read in the history books and not physically being able to visualize and experience the emotion and confusion of what a teenage boy or young adult had been forced to, to go into the army. Give us a sense of what it was like for you as a conscript in the army. I was in some sense uh, fortunate not to be actually on the ground, but as a pastor of a church, um, I had to deal with the lives of young people and their trauma, still being a very, very young pastor. I had to deal with the trauma of parents who lost a child uh, in, 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 in the conflict and had to deal with the anger of both my congregants and the anger and the trauma of very, very dear uh, black colored and Indian friends whom I learned to know whilst, while a student. Um, and, and that experience of, of, of just being pushed as a young pastor, bam, into this whole uh, broiling pot uh, of pain um, and anger just change you forever that uh, you, you you can never be the same again and you cannot rest until you see that there is reconciliation and healing if i close my eyes i see myself standing at graves um, and uh, i would not like my daughter or her children to be in that position ever 
And Mom Pauline, just the opportunity to have to speak about those hardships and those experiences, because more often than not, it's treated as a an event and it's often politicized and we're not dealing with the underlying emotion and the hurt that is still there. I mean, what is your gravest pain when you look back at uh, June 16, 1976? My gravest pain is uh, when we were attacked when we were still young and trying to give a message to the Department of Education to say this uh, Africans that you are feeding us, it's not conducive for us. Then instead of, that was a peaceful march which a memorandum was going to be given to the uh, education board to say, can you please uh, consider giving us a better education and with a better language understanding then the student were, were shot and Karen. and uh, the, the student were, were shot Hector Peterson fell in front of our eyes and uh, Hasten Ndlovu and many others and that made us to want to retaliate and that angered us. And I mean, nobody could have been prepared. I don't think there had been warnings necessarily. We had, you know, we're told again uh, through history and anecdotes that there had been in other areas, Ekurleni and the, the rest of the country, that this was going to be the big march. But I don't think the anticipation was that there would be that kind of bloodshed. So as a country, looking back, and having to deal with each other's hang-ups and prejudice and hurts. Dr. Khaibar, in communities that are not as integrated, maybe as in metropolitan areas, how do you even initiate a form of dialogue to say it's okay to come out, it's okay, you're not being condemned? I think the first place to start is to acknowledge that we neglected our task uh, in the previous decades not to open up dialogues with one another. We neglected uh, to talk about the realities um, of the country we live in and we neglected the fact uh, to call the atrocities by name, especially in our churches, especially I would like to say in the so-called white churches and then in my case in the Afrikaans community and if you want to open it now I think we must go back to our people and say sorry uh, we did not really help you as much as we should in the past can we engage in a new journey for the sake of the honor of the God whom we serve and for the sake of our people, our children and grandchildren, but eventually for this wonderful God-given land. And I'm sure communities will just say, come and help us. Yeah, but there's expectations on both sides and we live in a polarized society where uh, there's a, a, a need to defend one's culture yeah. and uh, not taking ownership. I mean, who, yeah. if we say that apartheid uh, the legacy thereof still manifests in today's society, most white people will probably feel, okay, now a finger is being pointed at me, and that's why the reconciliation process is so slow. But dealing with the, the victims particularly, Mampolin, and survivors, um, you could argue that not adequate has been done in dealing with that pain, because you can only know somebody's strife once you've walked in their shoes. Do you, which other way should June 16 be commemorated? What more would you like to see being done uh, as retribution? I would like to see June 16 being the day of remembrance, the day of commemoration, remembering those people who died and not only remembering them in a stadium, continually visiting and also having a structure whereby when they need counseling when they need help they should come and be accepted uh, and be helped or being advised to as to how to deal with this pain mm -hmm. because 
as uh, you can see, this pain is generating to the new generation, which they don't even know where does this pain manifest from. So we need to have that the priest, uh, like the constrict, are there, they have given themselves that we have to walk this journey of reconciliation. It's not a one day's uh, journey. It, it, uh, it's a step which, it's one step being going to, a, a step of a thousand miles start with one step. Mm. So we are going there, we are going to listen, we are going to work together towards this progress, towards this reconciliation. But when we see these kind of uh, very significant uh, watershed moments in society, it's often attended predominantly by black people. And you often ask yourself, well, it's a day of reconciliation or Freedom Day, it's uh, Women's Day, whatever it is, it's mainly black people. So where are the white folk in meeting black people halfway in this uh, process, Dr. Herbert? It's a very important thing you're asking um, and I think we need to look at ourselves um, uh, and I think the, the basis for this is this huge divide between communities or then communities moving towards communities. It's, it's just not being done and with the event of the 11th we want to start in a small way to breach it and that's why we're really inviting uh, the pink people um, all over the place. Please come to the Orlando Stadium on the 11th. Come and join us. Come and embrace others. Uh, put out your hands. Um, help to bump over the dominoes uh, for, a, for a new journey. Um, and it's going to be difficult. The same and we can come to it later, we're also moving to 16th of December as part of our process where we want to invite black people, please come to the Voortrekker Monument. Mm -hmm. you, you see, uh, and, and we need to breach these divides. Bishop, I know that this is in its infancy and it's something to be lauded and commended, but you know, speaking of people that are believers of faith, you know, of kindred spirit, it's a much easier message to receive. Mm. But those that have been intergenerationally been uh, indoctrinated with the venom and spew of hatred and still talking about the swart khafar and what have you, we see this play out in social media that racism is still very rife. Mm. Yeah. whether we like to admit it or not, uh, you know, being called monkeys as black people, etc. So how do you get the message to those that are not converted um, to, to participate in this process? You know, we, we, we are, we're all trapped in our ghettos, in our, in our mental ghettos. We have to find a way of breaking out into a new vision for society. And that is possible, but it has to begin at some point. I actually applaud the fact that no one actually had to go out and find the conscripts. They came out to find the churches to say, we need help. We want to make this journey. Now, often it is said that it is black people that are ready to reconcile and whites are not. But you know what? Um, on all sides, there will be people that are not interested in reconciliation. But reconciliation is actually a prerequisite for effective post-conflict democracy because you can have the structures change you can have government change the political parties change but if you do not change socially and economically at the level where people actually live and relate to one it's about relationships how do you build the kind of relationships that are normal for a democracy if that doesn't happen you'll always have the problems of mistrust of suspicion of a very easily you know, people, emotions are, 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 are evoked. So what this is about, it's about beginning that process. It's not easy. It's going to be a process that's going to take time and we want to walk the path. That's why we call it a journey towards the kind of society we will be proud of. All right, but the building relationships and the trust means that you have to dig deep into Absolutely. that which had divided you in the first place and deal with the prejudice and the hurt and hang-ups, Mampolin at your lowest level of uh, despair and hopelessness after the June 16 
uh, massacre. How did you overcome that which you had felt, I'm sure, towards the white soldiers or, or the white regime at the time? You know, it's, it, it's a long journey and I would like to thank also the TRC uh, because we were like forgotten until the TRC came to, to, to the reconciliation is not starting now. It has been there. In fact, our, our country, let me just say, our country, it's a country of peace and it's a country of reconciliation. Uh, you remember when uh, Tata Mandela was in prison, he reconciled, he, he forgave, you know. We have to walk in his shoes. For 27 years he was locked there. But he came out being strong and being a Christian, he said, I forgive and I want to move forward. What's your heritage, what's your legacy in, in the bigger scheme of things and in playing a part in this re reconciliatory process? So what's your story? My story? My story is to say we have to reconcile, we have to, to forgive one another, we have to move on. It's not for us, for our children. We're leaving our children who, who don't know apartheid, who don't know white and black. I remember my daughter was saying to me, Mom, you know, you have taken me to a white school. I'm half white, half black. I learned this to, from a white school. I learned this from you. So I'm sort of confused. Yeah. So uh, my story and my, my to, is to say, let us let this happen. Let us embrace one another and let us learn to forgive. We cannot forget. We talk about what happened. We remember what happened but we move forward for the benefit of our country. We don't want to see this country being like other country where anger yes. it's rife and people killing each other like they are not human. Hmm. Dr. Kherber, maybe you can give us a sense from the uh, conscripts and those that were forced in a sense to take lives and to be in uh, the firing line and how they feel um, when they look back and that they had stolen destinies and dreams of young black children who are essentially children uh, and who are posing no harm but because of the position where the conscripts were had to to fire in the face of somebody who could potentially have achieved greatness in life what do they what do they tell you there uh, is a myriad of emotions um, uh, anger because what I was put through regret because I did not refuse to do uh, a national service um, pain because what I did um, uh, and most of all the ghosts the spooker which they carry inside them uh, when they had to be in a conflict situation and shooting at someone. Um, we have to deal with that. And you will know, and that's part of the pain that uh, Pauline is, is talking of. After 1990, all parties of all conflict backgrounds were promised debriefing psychological help it never came not from the old regime and not from the new and we now dealing with generations of people who have not been helped so some of the anger and the backlash and the very difficult things we need to deal with as an Afrikaans community as a white community is because of what has not been done in a helping capacity to people. Mm. Uh, Bishop, do you think that this message would resonate to say the conscripts and, and the white males at the time who were forced to go to the army were in themselves just teenagers, um, fresh out of school and were forced to, to be in this particular position and that it would not be a natural or inherent desire 
for them to be in that position. Do you think that from the victims and survivors' point of view, this message would resonate? No, no, most people wouldn't take it that way. Um, um, and in fact, so much so that they hardly make a distinction between police and the army. It was all the system. <laughs> Yeah, you know, all the security forces. Yeah. It wouldn't resonate in that. In that, so we only in respect. When I think about my 19-year-old grandson, then I realize that they were really kids. <laughs> but you see, you said something earlier about um, the, 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 the ideologies, the values, and the beliefs. That, in fact, is the reason why the Southern Council of Churches is involved in this, because we are saying. We recognize that reconciliation will happen truly when we deal with things at the root level. And that's where your beliefs, your values, your ideologies, the things that really get you to do what you do, they are at the root level of your life. The fruits of the things that you actually, that, that make the headlines, are the results of what's underneath there. And so we, we, we have to go down there. We have not been there yet. And, and, and so as we have this symbolic action on the 11th, we are making a commitment to start the journey. That journey must involve really sitting down and, if you like, workshopping ourselves at community level, at parish level. What exactly do you believe in? How does it relate and resonate or otherwise with the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then, 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 only then can we do it. Because when we published the 19, in 1985 the Kairos document, it was time to deal with this. It was saying, you've got a, a state theology of a party that says, God has given authority to the apartheid regime to govern the way they do. And then there's a prophetic voice that says, no, God is actually on the side of the poor and the oppressed, that they must be given the space to live. Mm -hmm. And that the bulk of the church was in between, neither here nor there. And today we are saying, maybe we are together agreeing that what the prophetic theology was saying at the time was correct. And maybe we should try and make it much more of a mainstream living experience for most people. Yeah. I think that what the common narrative has been about uh, June 16, particularly survivors, is the fact that um, the, the, the hurt that, it, you know, is, is so deep and the, the decay and erosion of, you know, be it the, the, the moral fiber of society that you don't see. Your perspective is that you were wronged and redress has not been able to deal with, with the hurts of the past. So the, the greater majority, how do we reach them and bring them into the fold to say yes, even if you're carrying those prejudices uh, and you're carrying that kind of uh, toxic energy with you, you're welcome to come and express it in this environment. Mampoli. We, we are starting this uh, journey together to have a place, to have uh, resources to deal with the, the, the question that you are asking me now. Because um, as you can say, there, there are people there out there who, who, who still carry pain. They don't even know where their children are, what happened to them. And also, there's White Seat uh, Massacre where the, the, rent, the, 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 the police were sent to kill people for, for protesting against the rent which was high. And also at the night vigils, we do have uh, people who, who, who lost their children. At the uh, ordinary bearing, they are beloved ones. And the police will come and shoot and kill, you know. It, it, it's a lot of pain, and whenever we go there to people, to, to, it's like we are opening wounds, which we need to, to, to bridge. And some of them will ask us, why now? So forgetting that, the journey is being propelled by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, that we cannot just sit and sit back and not do anything about what happened in the past. And we, we really will appreciate to get a lot of support from the government, a lot of support from uh, business people, NGOs, and everybody should be involved in this part. It, not, it shouldn't be the June 16, the, the SACC, and the Coast Trip only. Mm. Even the, the TV people should help us in this journey. We need everybody to be involved. Yes, one point. But we also need to prepare ourselves for the resistance. I mean, if the conscripts are reaching out and say, look, I was young at the time. I did not mean to kill your son or loved one. And I ask for forgiveness. And, and there's resistance. I mean, what kind of 
conversations are you having in dealing with their own fears um, and suppose maybe apprehension about the whole process? I think um, we must acknowledge that we did not seriously take the wish of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that society at large should take the process forward and further. And one of the major things in the dealings of the Commission uh, was the telling of stories. When we started this process more or less a year ago, in one of the first meetings, and you will remember, spontaneously from the June 16 Foundation and the conscripts, people just started to tell their stories. And we really did not even know one another and suddenly there were tears. So if we can help to bring people together just to start to tell their stories again and again and again and create a wave of storytelling in this country, eventually we'll be able not only to hear but to listen. And out of listening and appreciation of what the others have been through and uh, is experiencing, I think I will be changed to help create a new future. I want to hear your story and my bishop's story. Pauline was telling me her story when we waited for this interview. All right, uh, just in short, uh, uh, Bishop, if you can give us the timelines. You said the 11th of uh, June, and that is the Saturday. What's going to happen if you'll give us just the bullet points? June the 11th is, I like to say, the Christmas Eve. Christmas is on the 16th. So the Christmas Eve is when you do all your preparatory work. So we're preparing ourselves, preparing our society on the 11th. We'll start, the doors of the Orlando Stadium will open at 8 o'clock, uh, but the, the program begins at 7 at Madibane High School, which is where, where one of the eight schools that started the march in 1976. And of course, the, the mayor of Johannesburg will then honor a, a student leader who fell on that day, A.B. Libello. And so the process will go on. But of course, there will be lots of uh, prayer, confessions, and, but there will also be a, there'll be a declaration that commits us to a future of equity for all. There will be music, we will be having the gospel, you know, Soweto Gospel Choir, Milon Gigantu, On, Beka, on, on Become to Africans Choir, and Hot Sticks Mabuza, and Mzwake Mbuli. There will be some, some, some entertainment. But I want to say just briefly that June 16th is in Houting. It's not the only story. In, SACC works in different provinces. Each province might identify something different to rally around. Eastern Cape might say it's the Langa Massacre. Western Cape might say it must be Kuhulu to seven. So we don't know. It will, as it spreads from, from, from month to month going forward, just like June 16th spread across the country, this too will. I thank you all for coming through today and really feel blessed and privileged to have you on the set. And that's, of course, the interview we're doing now regarding South Africa singing a new song as a build-up to June 16 as we commemorate 40 years uh, since the 16th of June 1976. We're back after this. Whilst we all enjoy a public holiday on the 16th June, let's not forget what Youth Day is about. South Africa commemorates the Soweto Uprising of 1976 on this day, a protest which was against the Bantu Education Act of the apartheid government. <laughs> <laughs> 